I remember thinking, you're drowning. You're, you're dying. This is it. This is the end. And I'm underwater. And at that point, everything stopped. And a voice was saying, they're going to be okay. Um, and then what I do remember next was being in the boat and uh, um, not being able to breathe. And we're in the middle of the rainforest. There's no way out of here. Um, it's 28 miles of rivers, our only exit. I'm a forensic pathologist and a neuropathologist. And, you know, I've conducted thousands of autopsies, investigated thousands of deaths, cut thousands of brains as a neuropathologist and a neuroscientist. Um, I was a professor of uh, anatomy and neurobiology at a big medical school in Boston and you know, had all the academic checks and won, won teaching awards and written books, you know, so it was, uh, that was the focus of my life at, at the time and um, it was work, 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 work. Um, so that's kind of where I, where I was. Philosophically, I was an atheist, hardcore. You couldn't convince me otherwise. And with my work, just really reinforce that because I, I can cut a brain and I can put it out for you. And I'll ask you, where's consciousness? Where's the soul? This doesn't exist. There's no proof for it in this brain. And everything that we think about as that process of consciousness, um, death is the dying brain. And it can be very easily explained through hypoxia, the chemical reactions that happen um, as the brain begins to uh, begins to die, which do happen. And, and but, you know, we get into confusing awareness with consciousness, but that's a, maybe another day. So that's where I was, you know, at the time. Um, it was my wife's 50th birthday and we had gone to Costa Rica, go on this whitewater rafting trip. And um, uh, I'm terrified. And I should preface the story a little bit with the idea that I grew up in Maine or always around lakes and water. Terrified of water, I hate water. I hate being around it. Um, I was always terrified I was going to drown. I always found excuses to not be in the water because um, I, I just always felt like I was going to drown. The other thing I used to do, and I never put these pieces together until after this, and this might make sense after the story. Um, I used to get really bored in school. And one of the things I would do is I would hold my breath, watch the second hand on the clock, see how long I could hold my breath. And then try to beat that record. And that's how I spent most of my elementary school. Um, and I always thought, someday I'm going to need this. Someday I'm going to need this. So fast forward 30 years, 40 years down the road, and I'm on this whitewater rafting trip. And it was, it was one of the most technically difficult rippers in the world. And um, we had our 10-year-old son with us, which I'm thinking as we're going down this river, this is probably not great parenting, but he had a great time. And we, we, we flipped. And I went under. And, um, you know, I didn't panic. I did all the things you're supposed to do, put my feet up and coming through the rapid. And I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. You know, I'm bouncing around these big waves. And um, then I got pulled under a couple of times. I got caught in a hydraulic and um, I couldn't get out. And I was stuck at the bottom of, of the, the river. And um, I came up, came down several times. And there was a point, the chase of the story, there was a point where I, um, I was drowning and I knew it. And I thought to myself very clearly, I remember thinking, you're drowning. You're, you're dying. This is it. This is the end. And I was thinking, shouldn't I be more upset about this? This is actually very calming. And I thought about the autopsies I'd done on people who had drowned. And I thought, well, this is a lot what you read about in books, that this is supposed to be a very peaceful way to die. And then I remember thinking, well, what the heck is taking so long? And I'm underwater. And at that point, everything stopped. And I was next to this huge boulder, and uh, which was under the water, and all the bubbles had stopped. Everything stopped. And I moved my hand through the bubbles, and they all just sort of moved around my hand in this very kind of weird way. And then there was this bright light. All this is happening simultaneously. I used to think it's a very cliché, um, like a sunset or a sunrise, but... Those are the only, it wasn't like that, but these are the only words I have in English language to explain something that's outside of normal human experience. I don't have the words for these. At that point, um, I was able to see everything around me, 360 degrees. Um, and I, I say it, see it, but more of experiencing it, more than seeing it. I knew that my wife had been pulled out. I knew it was a yellow kayak. I, I knew it was the guy down the river. I knew my son was in the other boat. 
Um, I knew the boat behind me was coming to get me. Um, I knew that my, um, I had a family member that was going through a very difficult personal um, crisis that I didn't know about, that I knew about, and I knew it was going to be okay. So that was very um, sort of uh, happening while, while I'm in, in this light situation. And there's this incredible overcoming feeling of love and so, a voice saying, they're going to be okay. So I get really emotional still, not because it's upsetting, but because I, I'm in that moment of that beauty. It was just so beyond experience. And um, I knew my family was going to be okay. And the voice said, they don't need you. You're going to be fine. And um, that was sort of uh, a moment where I just was like, this is amazing. And uh, they just kept repeating, they're going to be okay. They don't need you. You're done. Good job. Um, at that point, a voice in the back of my head was shouting, you're just hypoxic. You're just hypoxic. Hold your breath. You have to beat your record. You have to beat your record. And at, at that point, the light just sort of vanished. There was a giant sucking sound. And I slammed up against the rock and popped out of the water. When I came up, the boat behind me was almost to me, but I couldn't see anything. Um, I say my vision was like uh, a viewmaster. When those old viewmasters, I could see and it was gone. See and it was gone. I couldn't see motion. And we were through that rapid. And as uh, the water slowed and the boat came up to me, the guide in the boat put the paddle out for me to grab. And I remember reaching up and being, you know, in moments of blackout thinking, if I don't grab this paddle, I am done. And that's the last thing I remember. Um, and then what I do remember next was being in the boat and uh, um, not being able to breathe. And we're in the middle of the rainforest. There's no way out of here. Um, it's 28 miles of river is our only exit. And so I immediately slip into this uh, emergency medicine mode, ABCs, airway breathing circulation, trying to see if I'm okay. I'm the only doctor for hours, right? And I'm really worried about if I have water um, in my lungs because that can cause problems uh, later down the road in the next 24, 48 hours. You can have intense inflammatory reactions in your lungs that can kill you. It's called near drowning. Um, but I felt okay. I didn't feel like I had any water in my lungs. Um, what I realized had happened is I had a laryngeal spasm and it's something called a dry drowning. So when water uh, um, irritates your voice box, it closes off and it's a reflex and there's nothing you can do about it. And I remember being in the boat, trying to breathe and thinking, that's really great Cummings. You survived it. You got in the boat, you die in the boat, that, you know, typical, you know? So knowing that this is a reflex, I'm trying to calm myself down. Um, and I start being able to get little, little breaths in. And uh, eventually I was able to breathe. We continued down the river, like nothing had really happened. And I didn't really think much of it the rest of the day because, you know, my, I got my son, I got my family. I'm trying not to be freaked out by this. And that night when we got back to where we were staying, I um, I remember uh, looking at my Apple Watch because I'm a, I'm a kind of a health freak and I'm, I'm obsessed with my heart rate, um, sleeping heart rate, resting heart rate. And just so I have, I have a constant awareness of my heart rate. And I looked at my Apple Watch and I had eight minutes of unrecorded heart rate in that time period. Now it takes the caveat, it's an electronic device, sure. Um, it also takes the heart rate at intervals. So at least in those eight minutes, I had a period of time where I had no registered heart rate. It never happened before in that watch. It never happened after that in that watch. It didn't happen the rest of the time we were um, uh, on the river. And at that point I started to think something Something happened um, and we continue with the vacation. The next day we're going down the river and I'm a little freaked out by being in the river at this point. And my, we're paddling down. My son says, look at that butterfly on the boat. And I look over and it's this huge blue butterfly. And I was like, I said, Finn, that's not a butterfly. That's a, that's a bird. And he said, no, it's a butterfly. And it was so big and it was a blue morpho. And I didn't know anything about this butterfly until way later, about many, a couple of years later. Um, and it followed us the entire 28 miles down the river. Everybody saw it. 
the whole way. The next day we were rappelling down some waterfalls and I don't mean beside them, in them, right? This is my wife, this is a survivor vacation. So we're rappelling down 150 foot waterfalls and there's the blue morpho by my son the whole way. And so we call it the angel grand because my mom died a number of years ago. But So that was really profound. I didn't know about that until um, coming back. Um, which is kind of where I would jump to the after effects. Um, I was on vacation, didn't really have much on my mind when we came back. Um, and I started to notice um, I was having a lot of problems with time, uh, judging time, estimating time. And uh, you know how you, when you're doing something, you get, you get lost in it and you forget how much time you spent. That was every moment of my day. And it wasn't so much a problem on vacation, but when I went back to work, when I had a really heavy lecture schedule, I had labs and places I had to be, trains I had to catch, it became a really big problem. I was late for things. Um, I would forget, a, you know, I would be on my way to, to, to teach a class and run into somebody in the hall and start talking and 30 minutes would go by. So as I started to notice these time things happening, um, I, I realized that something, something was different. Um, I became very uncomfortable with my career pursuit. Um, those things weren't important to me anymore. Um, I, I said, I've written a couple of very bad novels, horror novels, um, but I say that I was the best character I ever created because I was this piece of paper and I couldn't identify with that anymore. Those things weren't important to me. And uh, here I was in this intense Boston malignant academic environment and it made me physically ill. I just couldn't be there anymore. Um, Jumping off of that, we ended up moving to Maine, where we were from, living in the woods and, and uh, having a great life. But the after effects were very difficult, and, and I didn't have a way to deal with it. You know, I, I think I had a hypoxic brain injury, and it's called dyschronometria, and I have difficulty. I have many ways to cope with it now. It's not, it doesn't affect my life, but um, that was really the catalyst for me to figure out what happened. That pushed me to do what I say, you know, I'm doing my own death investigation. Of, of my own consequences of that action had led me to an incredible world of research that I had no idea existed. Um, Jeffrey Long's book was so incredible. Um, the thing that was the most important for me in terms of turning the corner, because it, it was a very intrusive, negative experience that I did not want in my life. It completely derailed everything. I changed my course of my career, my life, my relationships. It's difficult to talk to pe people about it. It's alienating. Um, you know, when I did try to tell people about it, it was like, oh, that sounds really, really horrible. It's a good thing you're still here. Let's get a beer. You know, it was no one, it wasn't like I needed you to understand it. I just needed you to hear it because I needed to process it. But the thing that really turned the corner for me was um, uh, Yolaine Stout's paper, Six Challenges Faced by Near-Death Experiencers. That was probably the most profound thing I've ever read in my life. And every single one of those, yes. Yes, 75% of people who experience have a very hard time integrating this into their lives. And I knew nothing about these experiences um, other than what I'd seen in movies. I thought everybody came back and it was beautiful and you loved God and you quoted scriptures and, and everybody was happy and it was, it was a, the opposite for me. I, I, and so I had a really hard time reconciling that. And so the Stout paper really made me feel, feel very good about where I was and trying to, you know, I'm, I'm a newbie. It's only what, three years, three and a half years or so post my experience. So I'm still trying to figure this all out. And you know, I'm no great expert or pontiff on it. I'm, I'm still struggling. But what it really taught me, and I think really having this issue with being able to separate from time um, allows me to understand that, that what we do is we put great importance on the past and on the future. And we, we focus so much on those two things. Are those, that's where our importance is. But the value is here, right now. And getting out of those boundaries of time allowed me to put the importance where the value is and, and where I am right now. The people I'm with right now. The gift of death is, is teaching the ability to let go and to be alive. I mean, what's the point of music? The point of music is to listen. What's the point of life? The point of life is to live. 
and that that really helped me um, come to grips with who I am as a husband, a father, a, a human, my place on the planet. Um, so that's been incredible. And I, I think as physicians, you know, we all try to practice this thing called evidence-based medicine, um, which we need data and proof um, to, to treat patients so that they can get the best care possible. Um, and, and through that, we really pathologize, pathologize death. We, we, we sterilize it. We, 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 we try to prevent it. We, we medicalize it and we shield ourselves from it. Funerals happen very quickly after death. It's very fast. No one sees the body and you, you go very quickly back into life. We're not experiencing death. We've made it so sterile and kept it behind this curtain um, that we, we don't get a chance to really experience and celebrate the, the transformation that is happening. And I think as physicians, if, you know, it's not our, I think, like I think back to all the times as a forensic pathologist, I knocked on doors to tell people that loved ones were dead. I brought people down into the morgue to identify bodies. Um, I've sat with families in very horrible circumstances. And the number one question I've always been asked is, did they suffer? And as a physician, you always say, no, of course not. This was you know, sudden and we try to make them try to comfort them. But I always felt like a liar because I don't know. Right now I know, and I wish I could talk to those people again and say, look, this is beautiful. I mean, even under these horrible circumstances, the horrible circumstance is a second. The process after that is incredible. There's nothing to worry. I say that uh, no amount of worry will transform your future. No amount of grief is going to transform your fix your past. And you just have to be where you are right now and just and, and love that. And I think that that, is kind of where I am with it now.